And then the other thing is, man, get interested in native fish. A lot of states have laws against keeping a native fish in aquariums or you can't sell them, which I understand where they're coming from on that. But the funny thing is, there are um, it's just this the global exoticism is ridiculous. Like we have this these um, sort of fetish for cichlids from Lake Malawi, for example, that American fish keepers like. We like tropical fish from from Asia and from South America. And there are aquarium keepers in Asia who are like, oh wow, a largemouth bass. You know, like everybody is jealous of each other's fish. And we just take the stuff that we have for granted. I had such a ball watching this. This bluegill was a smart, really smart fish. It, would, it got to know me. It recognized me. Other people would walk up to the tank and be like, no. And I'd come up, and it was like, oh, I know you. I, I never th thought a fish could be that intelligent. Uh, and the colors were incredible. It was just such a joy to have around and just watch this thing uh, eat and just go about its business. And I think that it would be just better if maybe if, if fish stores were selling species from North America instead of stuff from the other side of the world that's going to cause trouble if you release it. My recommendation is ceviche. Oh, OK. For the snail. That is a good idea. Just fry it and just a ton of food seems like it'd be pretty delicious. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so a couple minutes ago you mentioned snakeheads, and I was just wondering if you've done like research slash ever hunted. Yeah, them. yeah, I don't have them in this. Um, uh, this is an older version of my slideshow, actually. Um, I had a hard drive crash. Yes, uh, I have done uh, quite a bit of stuff with snakeheads. They are in Virginia. I mean, people have heard about the population in Maryland, but they've spread throughout the Potomac River drainage. Uh, you know, you can go to, you can drive an hour and a half to like Mason Neck State Park. And you can fish for them, and yeah, we still don't know what the what the impact is. There is a chance that some biologists are saying that boy, they seem to be sticking to thick cover, and maybe they're going to get along in this habitat. We don't know. Uh, snakehead is actually it's really cool. It's um it's exciting to catch because they fight really hard, and it doesn't taste like most other fish. It has a really meaty texture. If you've ever eaten swordfish or, or mako shark, it's got that kind of a texture. You could put it on shish kebabs, you know, and cook it on an open fire. It's not going to fall off. It really does taste, I mean, the, uh, I, I cooked it for, at a, again, it was at a press event in New York. I had um, uh, an editor from uh, Outdoor Life magazine, a guy who's caught all kinds of fish all over the world and, uh, and, and eaten all sorts of stuff, and he thought it was a dead ringer for swordfish even. So it's a unique thing. There's nothing else you can catch around here that's going to taste like, and again, here's another one of those things where like, okay, if snakehead tastes just <coughs> like swordfish and has a texture like swordfish, then why do we need to over harvest swordfish to put in you know in restaurants if you've got something else that tastes like that let's stop let's stop killing swordfish and let's start killing snakeheads so, yeah, we have, name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know going back to my first point about the fish and wildlife management professions and, and based on some science but yeah. also heavily tied to economic factors of all kinds mm -hmm. fishing licenses people will spend more for fly fishing and rainbow trout which are exotic and introduced mm -hmm. <laughs> so being, um, it seems to me that that entrepreneurs will, will probably figure this out I mean I I fish a lot yeah. and I hunt a lot and I spend a lot of time <laughs> therefore in the woods and just floating from let's say the, the Rivanna River down to Bremo Bluff mm -hmm. you'll see thousands of catfish that are in the river. And red horse, you'll see I mean, more red horse like, suckers. Not like yes. I've never seen before in my life, right now. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean this month, but I yeah. mean yeah. now, currently. And, and there's a belief that those fish are competing successfully with smallmouth bass, which is a much preferred economic and sport fisher, mm -hmm. right? So those issues are everywhere, mm -hmm. it seems to me. So um, it seems to me like trespassing laws and game laws could be modified rather easily mm -hmm. if those professionals would not, um, I guess for lack of a better word, would not maybe be so narrow-minded that I put the brand on them, it's called a bad name, mm -hmm. therefore, oh God, let, let people, uh, the species themselves will sort it out somewhat, I think, but I hope you work for the Game Commission, I know. I do, and I just started I, working for so the So that game you're in these fishes. seminars with them. I think some of us who are just regular guys are out there, uh, would benefit from some kind of interaction with these more scientific types. So I hope when you're when you're you mean, you mean to encourage people to fish for the. For well, the no. Let's say for let's go like a trespass. Mm -hmm. I, I I was down in Florida. I just I caught 400 pounds of grouper mm -hmm. in about two hours. But, but I really enjoy it. By the way, it's it's too much like work. Yeah. 
But I saw tilapia on every golf course, every, yep. just like you said. So you say, well, a tilapia will eat things, uh, will eat uh, algae, or uh, for trespass, you just say, look, on Mondays, we'll allow you to come in here with traps. I see what you're saying, yeah, access, yeah. The, the, these social and economic rules are, are, are really more important barriers in my view. Yes, yes. No, you're abs actually, you, you raise a good point, okay, with regard to the, the golf courses. Yeah, there is so much land in Florida that's actually producing food that is not being used. And you do get, there's um, a sort of, um, there's a community of people who are sort of um, guerrilla hunter-gatherers actually in Florida and it's the well, um, it, it, it's 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 it's, um, it's it's undocumented workers a lot of them don't speak English but you know they're looking for food and actually there a lot of them their their landscaping is a huge business in Florida because everything's landscaped and so a lot of these these guys are landscapers so they go out and scout stuff out when they're on the job and they see there's so many citrus trees and mango trees and coconut trees where nobody just drops all this food and nobody picks it up and, and then you have all these ponds in housing developments and uh, uh, so vacation communities and golf courses that are loaded with fish. And it's invasive fish that need to be gone. And you're right, it makes no sense. And they, these people, well, they'll come in at night with a cast net. They, put, you know, they got the little pickup truck, they jump out of the back and you know, they're throwing a net or whatever and they're getting fish and another guy is picking up the mangoes. And sometimes they'll go and they'll sell the, um, the fruit at like roadside stands and they'll eat it. And, and it's ridiculous that they have to do this. And wouldn't, yeah, it, wouldn't it be nice if there was some system? The problem is that the stakeholders right now are undocumented workers who have no advocacy for this. You know, it would be really great if, some, if there was, if there was some organization criminal. doing this. I mean, I think there is a risk, but as their, as their plight, their poverty yeah. uh, gets worse, they're going to be more inclined to stretch the rules or yeah. to break the rules. If you go just out to Lake Albemarle here, mm -hmm. you, you've been up there yep. Road. You, and I go fishing there occasionally. Most of the people I see fishing there are Hispanic, mm -hmm. Latinos, right? And they're taking whatever fish because it's cultural. No, right? it tastes good. And I don't, I, by the way, I get yeah. as many as you can, yeah. right? But there are many farm ponds in Virginia right now that would, could produce more protein for people who are essentially up against it in the social economic terms. Yep. You just let them on there for a week, you'd have a better lake, a better pond, yeah. right? And they would eat. Yeah, and I mean that takes a certain amount of whatever you call this. I don't think it's creative, but it to me it's kind of yeah. like, why don't we fix this up? Because the legal, social, and ecological systems. Yeah, we we have a tremendous about, amount of land, both public and private, that is producing a lot of really good food, and in many cases, food that needs to be removed from the habitat in the first place. Whether it's an excess population of deer that are causing that are damaging nesting habitat for birds, or whether it's um, uh, it's it's tilapia in the water, there's a tremendous amount of food, and it's kind of ridiculous that uh, you know as we look at we look for we look for environmentally sustainable ways of producing food. You've got this land that's it's dual use. You know, if you have um, uh, you've, you've got a pond in the golf course. Okay, it's providing. This is land that's produce, producing recreational opportunities, yeah. and it's providing habitat for a few things, and it can also produce food. You know, the same thing with um, you, you've got uh, parks or um, or golf courses. You know, even here, you've got deer that come on there and graze. You have a park that, that the deer come and they eat the acorns, and it's producing. So you've got recreation uh, recreational use, and you've got habitat use by lots of other species, and then it can also produce probably I think I think around like. Uh, uh, around 15 to 20 pounds of venison per acre at like maximum density. Uh, nothing else does that, you know. I mean, I, aside from uh, wild fisheries in the ocean, you know, when we, if we have, if you want to eat beef or you want to eat soy, okay, you've got, if you've got a thousand acres of farmland producing soy, well, that's it. It's not doing anything else. I guess it's making a little bit of oxygen, but it's not good habitat for many animals. In fact, they're constantly trying to deny that habitat to other species. It's not producing recreational opportunities, but wild food, like golf, um, from golf ponds and things like that you're talking about, really, they're not making any more land. We're losing arable land every year. You've got desertification happening in different places. This is a way to kind of grab some land back and produce some food without risking those other uses. So I just want to interject and all this talk of food is making me remember that we have this wonderful <laughs> spread in the back. So maybe we could turn this conversation into more of a milling about and noshing so that food doesn't go to waste. Again, I want to remind you anyone who's interested, uh, the bookstore has generously brought books up and let's formally thank, thank Jackson for this wonderful